This is a recording of one of the articles on my blog. You can find a link to the article in the description. Artificial general intelligence is here and it's useless. One of the most misunderstood ideas that's polluting the minds of many popular intellectuals, many of them seemingly accustomed with statistics and machine learning, is the potential or threat that developing an artificial general intelligence, AGI, would present to our civilization. This myth stems from two misunderstandings of reality. One such misunderstanding is related to the refinement and extensibility of current ML algorithms and floating-point algebra hardware. However, discussing that has always led to people arguing what-ifs. For example, what if cheap quantum computers with very efficient I.O. become a thing? Thus, I won't pursue that line of thought here. A second, more easy to debunk misunderstanding, is related to the practicality of an AGI. Assuming that our wildest dreams of hardware come true, would we be able to create an AGI, and would this AGI actually have any effects upon the world other than being a fun curiosity? Part 1. We already have AGIs. AGI is here. As of the time of writing, there are an estimate of 7 billion and roughly 700 million AGI algorithms residing upon our planet. You can use the vast majority of them for less than $2 an hour. They can accomplish the vast majority of intellectual tasks that can be well defined by humans. Not to mention that they can invent new tasks themselves. They are capable of creating new modified versions of themselves updating their own algorithms, sharing their algorithms with other AGIs, and learning new complex skills. To add to that, they are very energy efficient. You can keep one of them running optimally for $5 to $50 a day, depending on location, and for much cheaper if you want them to run suboptimally, much less than your average server farm used to train a complex ML model. This is a rather obvious observation, but one that needs to be noted nonetheless. Almost nobody has ever complained about the severe lack of humans in the world. If I were to ask anyone what they would envision as making a huge, positive impact upon the future, few would answer a vastly increasing birth rate. So, if we are agreed on the fact that let's say 70 or 700 billion people wouldn't be much better than 7 billion people, that is to say, adding brains doesn't scale linearly, why are we under the assumption that artificial brains would help? If you disagree on that assumption, then what's stopping the value of human mental labor from skyrocketing if there's so much demand? What's stopping hundreds of millions of people with perfectly average and working brains from finding employment at much higher rates. Well, you could argue it's about the quality of the intelligence, and not all humans are intellectually equal. Having a few million artificial Joe Nobody wouldn't help the world that much, but having a few dozen von Neumanns would make a huge difference. Or, even better, what about having an AI that's much more intelligent than any human that we've ever encountered. This leads me to my second point. Section 2. Defining intelligence. How does one define an intelligent human, or intelligence in general? An IQ test is a go-to measure of human intelligence used by sociologists and psychologists. However, algorithms can readily outscore humans in IQ tests for a very long time actually, and they are able to do so reliably with more and more added constraints. See links in the article. The problem here is that IQ tests are designed for humans, not for machines. But let's assume that we come up with a machine intelligence quotient, MIQ, and we test our potential AGI friends in such a way that they cannot use their perks to cheat on that test. But how do we design it to avoid the pitfalls of human IQ tests when taken to the extreme? Our purpose, after all, is not to grade algorithms with this test, 
in a stagnant void, but to improve them in such a way that scoring higher on the test means that they are more intelligent. In other words, this MIQ test needs to be very efficient at spotting intelligence in outliers. If we come back to our IQ test, we'll notice it's rather inaccurate at the end of the distribution. Have you ever heard of Marilis von Savant or of Chris Logan or of William James Siddis or of Kim Ung Yong? These are, as far as I know, the highest IQs ever confirmed. The most intelligent members that our species currently contains based on IQ. I won't even question their presumed intelligence, but their achievements are rather unimpressive. Go down the list of high IQ individuals and you'll mostly find rather mediocre people with a few highly interesting quirks. For example, they can solve equations really quickly, they can speak a lot of languages, they can memorize a lot of random facts, etc. There is most certainly an overlap between the people that have created impressive works of engineering, designed foundational experiments, invented theories that explain natural processes, became great leaders, and so on. Let's call these people intelligent for the sake of brevity in the true sense in which we think of intelligence rather than the narrow sense of an IQ test. But IQ is not a predictor of this intelligence. It's more of a filter. You can almost guarantee that a highly intelligent person will have a high IQ, but having the highest IQ doesn't guarantee that you will be in the top 0.1 of intelligent people. So even if we somehow manage to create this MIQ, and if it's a good indicator of whether or not a machine is intelligent, as good as IQ, for example, it will still be a bad criterion to benchmark against in order to improve these algorithms, because it won't be able to spot the outliers that we are actually looking for, the algorithms which are exceptionally intelligent. We might be able to say an intelligent algorithm should have an MIQ of at least 100, but we'll hardly be able to say having an MIQ of 500 or some other large value means that the algorithm has superhuman intelligence. It's most likely that having a very high MIQ means that the algorithm has overfit in some way that's allowing it to cheat the MIQ test. That is to say, the algorithm has essentially found a flaw in the MIQ test. The problem is that we aren't intelligent enough to actually define intelligent. If the definition of intelligence doesn't exist, there is no clear path to finding out what it is. Even worse, I would say that's highly unlikely that the definition of intelligence actually exists in a static way. We might be able to define what intelligent means right now, but not so much in 20 or 100 or 2000 years time. What I might consider intelligent is also not what you might consider intelligent. Our definitions may overlap to some extent, and we'll likely be able to come up with a common definition of what constitutes average intelligence or intelligence in general, for example the IQ test, but they would diverge towards the tail end, towards the very intelligent part of the distribution, which again is what we care about if we are optimizing algorithms for intelligence. But you may say, even if that's indeed true, we can judge people based on their achievements. We can disagree all day whether or not some high IQ individual is a quark numerologist or a misunderstood science god, but we can all agree that someone like Richard Feynman or Tom Mueller or Alan Turing is rather bright based on their achievements alone, no IQ test needed. However, that brings me to my Third and most important point. Part 3. Testing Intelligence The problem of our hypothetical superhuman IGI, since we cannot come up with a simple test to determine intelligence, is that it would have to prove itself as capable. 
the way I see it, there's a few ways to do this. One, we can use previously collected data and see if the AI is able to perform on said data better than other humans and better than other AIs. Two, we can use a very good simulation of the world and see if the AI is able to achieve superhuman results competing inside the simulation. Three, we can give the AI the resources to manifest itself in the real world and act in the same ways that human would. A robotic body with a bunch of resources in the form of money vested to it, but the benefits of a computer brain. Approach number one is how we currently train machine learning algorithms and has the limitations of only allowing us to train on a very limited task where we know all of the possible paths once the task is complete. For example, we can train a cancer detecting AI on a set of medical imaging data because it's rather easy to then take all of our subjects and test whether or not they really have cancer using a more expensive and lengthy test, such as a biopsy or just waiting until they develop symptoms. It's exponentially harder to train a cancer curing AI since that problem contains a lot of what ifs that cannot be all explored at once. There are limitless treatment options and given that a treatment fails, meaning that a person dies of cancer, we can't really go back and try again to see what the correct treatment would have been. I wrote a bit more about this problem here, link in post, if you're interested in reading about it a bit more. But I assume that most readers with some interest in statistics or machine learning have stumbled upon this issue countless times already. This can be solved by approach number two, which is creating simulations in which we can test an infinite amount of hypotheses at a very low cost. The only problem being that creating simulations is rather computationally and theoretically expensive. To go back to our previous example of a cancer curing AI, currently the bleeding edge of biomolecular dynamic simulations is being able to simulate a single medium sized gene in a non-reactive substance for a few nanoseconds by making certain estimations that speed up our simulation and make it a bit less realistic. And to do that, you need a supercomputer worth a few dozens of millions of dollars and, well, a few weeks or months. So the whole simulation thing might not work out so well after all. Coincidentally, most phenomena that can be easily simulated are also the kind of phenomena that are either very simplistic or that fall into category one, where we can know all the possible states by just collecting the data that comes out of experiments. So yeah, go figure. Then we are left with approach number three, giving our hypothetical AGI the physical resources to put its humanity changing ideas in practice. But who's going to give away those resources? Based on what proof are they going to give them away? Especially when the proposition here is that we might have to try out millions or billions of AGIs before one of them is actually extremely smart, much like we do with current machine learning models. The problem, of course, is that resources are finite and controlled by people, not in the sense that they are stagnant, but we can't create an infinite amount of resources on demand, nor can we create them cheaply the way we would do in a simulation. Nothing of extrinsic value is free. And that actually leads me to another complaint. That is number four, the problem of gradual tool building. The process by which humanity, or at least science and engineering advances, once you boil it down, is one of building new tools using previous tools. People in the Bronze Age weren't enabled to smell steel because they didn't have the intelligence to figure it out, 
but because they didn't have the tools to reach the desired temperatures, evaluate the correct iron and carbon mixture, mine the actual iron out of the ground, and establish the trade networks that would make the whole process viable. As tools of bronze helped us build better tools of bronze, that helped us discover more easy ways to mine iron deposits, build ships and caravans to trade materials, and build better smelters. And we were suddenly able to smelt steel, which led us to being able to build better and better tooling out of steel, etc, etc. Human civilization doesn't advance by breeding smarter and smarter humans. It mainly advances by building better and better tools. The gradual knowledge that we acquire is mostly due to our tools. We don't own our knowledge of particle physics or chemistry just to a few blokes that figured it all out. We owe it to the years of cumulative tool building that led us to being able to build the tools to perform the experiments that gave us the insights required to actually come up with the ideas in those fields. In other words, take away Max Planck and you might set quantum mechanics back by a few years, but in a rather short time, someone would have probably figured out the same thing. This is rather obvious when you look at multiple discoveries through history. That is to say, people discover the same thing at about the same time without being aware of each other's work. On the other hand, have Max Planck be born among a tribe of hunter-gatherers in the Neolithic period, and he might be a particularly clever hunter or a shaman or something, but it's essentially impossible for him to have the tooling which allowed him to make the discoveries about nature that 20th century Planck made. However, to some extent, the process of tool building is inhibited by the basic laws of space and time. If we decide to build a more efficient battery, or a more accurate electronic microscope, or a more accurate radio telescope, we wouldn't be necessarily limited just by our intelligence, or even mainly by our intelligence, but by the thousands of hours required for our factories to build the better tools that will then allow us to build better factories, that will then allow us to build better tools, that will then allow us to build better factories in order to build even more amazing tools, etc, etc. Thousands of amazing discoveries, machines and theories lie basically within our grasp, but one of the biggest bottlenecks there is not intelligence, but resources. No matter how smart your inter interstellar spaceship design is, you will need rare metals, radioactive materials, hard to craft carbon fiber, and the machinery to put it all together, which is rather difficult since we've collectively decided by the mechanism of the market that those resources are much better spent on other things, such as portable masturbation aids, funny looking things that we can stick on our bodies and giant bombs just in case we need to murder most of humanity. So would a hypothetical super intelligent AGI help this process of tool building? Most certainly, but it will probably end up with the same bottleneck that people that want to create amazing things face today. That is to say, other people that don't want to give up their toys, and the physical reality that requires the passage of time to shape it. The fact that a lot of processes almost inherently cannot be instantaneous. We must wait for them to happen. So don't get me wrong, I'm not necessarily blaming people for choosing to focus on 3D printing complex water resistant phallus like structures instead of say, using those same resources to create senolytic nanobots. As I've mentioned before, defining intelligence is hard. And so is defining progress. What might seem awesome for the AGI reading this article, or in this case, listening to this recording, could be rather boring or stupid for a few other billions of AGIs. 
And there's nothing fundamental to say which one of them is wrong. In conclusion, artificial general intelligence is something we have plenty of right now, right here on Earth. Most of it goes waste. So I'm not sure that designing AGI based on human models would help as much. Superhuman artificial intelligence is not something that we can really define since nobody has come up with a comprehensive definition of intelligence that is self-sufficient. Rather, any definition that we might come, come up with requires real-world trial and error to test. Superhuman artificial intelligence is not something that we can test, since we cannot gather statistically valid training datasets for complex problems, and we can't afford to test via trial and error in the real world for much the same reason why we cannot afford to test all human intelligence design things via trial and error. Even if superhuman artificial intelligence was somehow created, there is no way of knowing that they'd be of much use to us. It may be that intelligence is just not the biggest bottleneck for our current problem, but rather time and resources. If you think that you have a great business idea that could only take off if you had an AGI, well, feel free to hire one of those 3 billion people living below the poverty line that will gladly help you with tasks for a few dollars an hour. It's likely to be much, much cheaper than even renting out a server farm to train machine learning algorithms on it. Amazon is already doing this with Alexa, whereby it has humans listening and writing out answers to people instead of actually using machine learning algorithms, since it turns out that it's somewhat cheaper. Is that to say I'm against the machine learning revolution? Of course not. I'd be rather hypocritical if I was against it, since that's the field I work in. I think it will lead to tremendous human progress in the following decades. But we have to stop romanticizing or fear-mongering about the pointless concept of a human-like intelligence, an artificial general intelligence, being produced by software. Instead, we should think about machine learning, or AI, if you must really call it that, as a tool in our arsenal of thinking tools. Machine learning is awesome if you apply it to the set of problems which is good at solving. And if we try to extend that set of problem by being better at collecting data and building algorithms, we might be able to accomplish some amazing feats. But the idea that an algorithm that can mimic a human would be of particular use to us is similarly silly to the idea that a hammer, which also serves as a teaspoon, would revolutionize the world of construction. Tools are designed to be good at their job and not much else. And they are designed that way for a reason. Who knows, maybe someday we'll combine some of these awesome algorithms and add a few extra bits and bob there, shield them in a realistic looking robot body and realize that the thing we've created might as well be a human then it can join us and billions of other humans in being mostly useless and doing nothing of much value. If you enjoyed this recording, you can find more of my work at blog.cerebralab.com. Links in the description. <laughs>